here is another fun, and the keyword is fun. I should write it up here. Because why would you do it if it's not fun? Gauss's law problem. It's, it's not a Gauss's law problem particularly. It's really an, an electric flux, and I'm doing this as part of, you know, how do you find fluxes? We were doing flux with uh, Stokes' theorem and stuff like that. So here's the problem. I have a hemisphere, and I have a constant electric field in the z direction. And so this sphere is centered on the z axis in this case, uh, and we want to find the flux through the, the surface. And you may already see a trick. I'll show you the trick at the end, but I like to do the hard stuff first. Okay, so just, just it's fine. Okay, so here I have my electric field, some constant electric field in the z direction. And here's the definition of the flux. It's a surface integral of e dot n hat dA. Now, it, it's kind of a hard problem because the electric field's constant, but n hat is not constant, right? If I look at a little piece of surface area right there, then n hat is this way. n hat is always perpendicular to the surface. Over here, that n hat is this way. So I need an expression. I need to take the dot product. I only want the component of E in the direction of n hat. That's what that says. And then I can do a surface integral. You can't just integrate E over the surface because E is a vector. Because you've got to have that n hat in there. And so I've already started. I wrote down some important stuff about spherical coordinates because here we have a, a conflict, right? Do I use Cartesian coordinates because the electric field is in Cartesian coordinates? Or do I use spherical coordinates because I'm dealing with a sphere or half of a sphere? And the answer is, it's going to, I'm going to be better off using spherical coordinates. I'm better off using spherical coordinates because I need to add up areas over the sphere. So even though I have to deal with this electric field in the z direction, which is not a spherical coordinate, then I have, it's just going to be easier in the end. Because if, if I wanted to change this to Cartesian coordinates, it's really hard to find dA in Cartesian coordinates for the sphere. It's not impossible, just difficult. Okay, so I have E. I need to get n hat. Well, in spherical coordinates, that's not too bad, right? Because if I have the vector r for each of these pieces, the vector r, that's a, that's a vector r, and, and the location of each of those pieces is a radius r, so the vector r is just going to be r r hat. But n hat is in the same direction of that, so n hat is just going to be r hat. So n hat equals r hat because my sphere is centered on the origin. But I can't take the dot product between this and this because I have, that's a Cartesian unit vector and this is a spherical unit vector. They have to be in the same units in order to be able to do a dot product. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We need to get this in spherical coordinates. That's the hard part. That's really the only hard part. So let's look at this um, from the side. So this is the z-axis, and this is the x-axis, and then here is my piece right there. And actually, I know the area of that piece in spherical coordinates. The area element, which I'm not going to derive, is r squared, r, cap, use capital R because it's constant distance from the uh, origin, sine phi, uh, d phi, d theta, and yes, I am using this as the angle phi. Um, now, I always have to give a warning. There's a lot of textbooks and humans that use this as phi, and then the projection into the xy plane has an angle of theta with respect to the x-axis, and then a lot of people switch it up. So you've got you to gotta be careful about that. Just be careful. It's fine. Okay, so if I have my electric field vector E, I need to know how much in the r direction and how much in the phi direction. So this is the direction of r. This is r hat direction. It's in the direction of increasing r. And phi hat is in the direction of increasing phi, which is actually this way. right? Because as phi gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it goes this way. So this is phi. That's the direction of phi hat. And if that is the angle phi, then this is the angle phi. And I'm doing this the the think it through way. You can actually find uh, an expression for unit vectors in terms of other unit vectors with partial derivatives, but I just didn't want to do that. We don't have to. So if I look at this, and I, sh I 
should have drawn my E a little bit bigger. But I want to find out how much of this is in the R direction. So that's this amount right here of that uh, right triangle. So if this is, let's call that just one, right? We're just dealing with Z hat. Uh, and that's the angle phi, then this side would be cosine of phi. So cosine phi r hat is the, is the r hat component of the vector z. Does that make sense? OK. Now what about phi hat? Well, it's going to be like this part, right? But phi hat's going the opposite direction. So this is going to be equal to negative sine phi. So I can write e as the vector e0 times cosine phi r hat minus sine phi phi hat. And there's no theta component, right? It's not pointing in, in the direction going this way. It's only pointing up and to the side. So I don't have to worry about a phi. So there's my e hat. Now I can do e dot n hat. It's going to be e dot r hat. Well, there's no um, phi hat component to my unit vector. It's just r hat. So I just get uh, e0 cosine phi. Yay. OK, so now I got rid of the vector up here. I can just write this as a double integral. OK, so I have phi equals the double integral. And I'm going to in be integrating, in this case, uh, from phi equals 0 to pi over 2, right? I'm not going to pi because I'm just going from here down to there. But for theta, I'm going all the way around. So theta will be from theta equals 0 to 2 pi. And then I have cosine phi. And then I have to put in my dA, which is r squared sine phi d phi d theta. So I have, I'll put it over here. I have r squared e0 cosine phi sine phi d phi d theta. So I just need to do a double integral right there. Let's integrate over phi first. So if I integrate over phi, uh, I can factor that stuff out front just to make this look a little bit better. r squared e0, I'll just leave it this as a double integral, cosine phi, sine phi, d phi, d theta. So I need to do this integral. Uh, so here, the more you do integrations, the more you see tricks, the more you see a possible way to do that. And so in this case, if I have a derivative and a function, so if I can make a substitution with the derivative there, then I'm going to be okay. So let's make the substitution u equals cosine phi. And if I take the derivative of that, I get the derivative of u is going to be equal to negative sine phi, but then I have to take the derivative of the inside, so I get d phi. And you'll notice right here I have sine phi d phi, but I just have the negative sign. So this integral is going to be, let's just put that one integral, cosine phi sine phi d phi from phi equals 0 to pi over 2. I don't have to worry about changing the limits because I can just change back before I do the limits integration. This is going to be the integral from u, which I don't really care about, of negative u du. I can integrate that. That's not too hard. The, the answer to that is going to be negative u over 2 from u squared, u to u1 to u2, whatever they are. But instead of evaluating u, I'm just going to put back in my value for du, and I get negative cosine squared phi over 2 from 0 to pi over 2. OK, so yeah, from 0 to pi over 2. I'm thinking, so cosine, so if I put in cosine of pi over 2, that's right, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So I get this is going to be equal to 0 minus negative cosine of 0, which is 1. So I get minus 1, minus a negative 1 half, so I get 1 half. Okay, so now I can put that back in the other integral. I get phi equals the integral from theta equals 0. I have a r squared e0 out there of 0 to pi, 2 pi of 1, 1 half d theta. Now that one's not too hard to do. I don't even have to use substitution. So this is going to be equal to r squared e0 over 2 theta 
from 0 to 2 pi. And that's going to be equal to r squared e0 2 pi over 2 minus 0, or pi r squared e0. And you're going to say, hey, aha, I told you you did this the hard way. Why did you do this the, the long way? Well, let's go back over here and do it the easy way now, because uh, that is indeed the answer. So here's my boundary of my sphere, of my hemisphere. And so what I can do is to use Gauss's law. Gauss's law says that uh, the integral of E dot n hat dA over a closed surface is equal to Qn over epsilon naught. If the electric field is constant, then there can't be any net charge inside of here. So this is going to be equal to zero. Well, I can break the closed uh, surface integral into two parts. I can say this is going to be equal to E dot n hat dA equals phi 1 plus phi 2. And so the bottom part down here with n hat going down is for phi 2. And then this part that we just did, there, that distinguishes that. With n hat going in different directions, that's phi 1. So phi 1 has to be equal to negative phi 2. I already did phi 1. Let's just do phi 2 because it's actually pretty easy. So for uh, this case, n hat is equal to negative z hat, right? Because it's in the negative z direction. So e dot um, n hat is just going to be negative e0. So now for phi 2, it's going to be equal to uh, the surface integral of e, negative e0 dA. That's a constant. So if I pull that out front, I get negative e0, the double integral dA. But I'm just integrating over a circle. So this is just going to be equal to negative e0 pi r squared. So e1 is the negative of that. So, I mean, phi1 is negative of that. So I just get e0 pi r squared, which is the same thing I got before. The end. I don't have anything else to say, and I don't know why I'm still here. Okay, I'll talk to you later.